Thank you, Brother Borders. You may be seated. I deem this a great privilege to be here in the meeting tonight down at Port Alvernia among friends who are pilgrims and strangers uh, to the world, soul journey now, waiting for the coming of the Lord to be taken to a better city, a better land where there is no death, no sorrow. And we are waiting for that time of the coming of the Lord. Uh, not long ago, I had the privilege of being with your pastor, Brother Bisco, and we had some a little trip together afterwards, a little hunting trip up in northern British Columbia, and he told me he was missionarying to the Indian people over here on the, on the island. And, oh, I've always wanted to help somebody who's trying to help the Indian people. I've had a few experiences down in the States with speaking to the Indians, the Navajo and Apaches and many of them down there, and find such a wonderful faith. And Brother Eddie, uh, not underwritten by anyone, and I said, maybe sometime I'd have the opportunity to come by and help you, Brother Eddie. He said, I'd be so happy for that, Brother Brandon. So we are here tonight on his invitation. And... Uh, my son, he came over a few moments ago, and he gives out prayer cards to pray for the sick. Usually we don't do that the, around the first night when it's going to be a big meeting until we get everybody settled down until they understand. But tonight, man, we just got three nights. I said, you better give out some prayer cards, and, and we will pray for the sick the first night so that we can get started right along. Uh, and he come and he met me, and he said, Daddy... There's just one bad thing about the meeting. So just to be three nights, it ought to be three weeks. He said, these are such lovely people. Now, we never judge people by how much they own or how bigger homes they live in, how they dress. We judge them by what's in their heart. That's where God lives in the heart. And when you find simplicity, humility, loveliness, that, that's what we love. We just love that. I was born again in a little group of people like this one time. And uh, I've always thought they were, they were the humblest, nicest people, and they're the ones I've lived with on earth, and I believe I'll live with them in glory Amen. through the ceaseless ages to come. And I remember my first experience with ministering to Indians, and I suppose these are Indian folks sitting out here in the front, I just imagine so, and, and I'm very happy to be with you. I, uh, a real American. <laughs> Correct, real Americans, the ones that God gave America to, the Indians. So I'm so thankful. Uh, down deep in my veins flows just a little bit of the blood. My mother's grandmother come from the reservation. And I've always deemed that one of the greatest privileges to say that down in me is part really American, for there's a little background somewhere of Indian blood that I'm very happy for, very thankful. And I've always wanted to minister to him because my mother was a real lady. She just went home to glory, an aged old woman with a real experience of being safe in the arms of Christ. I held her hands while God come and took her just recently. And I know what she was and what a sweetheart she was to me and a mother, and I, I love her. And uh, I'm so glad tonight to be ministering to, to the people. I was in Arizona some one first beginning of my ministry, and there was um, one night coming through the prayer line where I was ministering with the Spanish-speaking people. And uh, there was two Indian, the first two that I ever ministered to, and one of them was an alcoholic, and the other one was a tuberculosis on a stretcher case. And when I seen them come into the line, I stopped a few moments. And I said, just a moment, and I said, Heavenly Father, this is my first time now to pray for, for what I call full-blooded Americans. I said, if, if you ever want me to minister to them and go to their tribe, if you'll heal them, I promise you I'll go. And I prayed for them, and before I got to the next meeting in California, the alcoholic had lost all taste for alcohol and had become a born-again Christian, and the two burglars 
and a week's time was pronounced by the, the doctor out on the reservation that she was sound and well. So I went back to the, to the Apache tribe. I'll never forget it. I hope I don't take too much time. Now, I'm always used to talking too long. Everybody always tells me I talk too long. That's for white people, not for Indians. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Um, we, um, I preached a short sermon the other day down at my tabernacle at home. Just six hours, that's all I preached. So. <laughs> but um, we, um, we Indians were never in a hurry, you know. So we, we got plenty of time to listen. And so, when, so this, that night, they taken me up to the reservation. And, oh, my, i never seen so many. There. It's a beautiful sight. They come in their wagons and everywhere been announced all across the reservation. And they sat down out on the ground. I was standing on a little porch step, a little church about like this. There were many Indians on the inside. And, um, but oh my, the tr- all, half of the tribe of them were sitting out there. Oh, I may get uh, four or five thousand, something like that, uh, gathered on the outside. And so um, I was speaking from the church steps, a little Assembly of God church. And the missionary had been pastoring there for some time. And um, so I had one interpreter. They could not understand English. And um, so I had one interpreter, which was a lady. Well, I tried in the simple way that I could to lay out the Bible to them. And I remember they just sat and watched. You know, I say this through love. Uh, An Indian, when once convinced, he never moves. But he's something like uh, feeding a horse. He don't eat in the wrong stall. You see, he waits till he's sure what he's talking about. So they were waiting. And so he was watching to see what I was going to say. And I kept telling him, I said, now, I'm just one vote, one person here in the country. I said, I do believe that there was some kind of a deal that should not have been done to the Indian. I said, I, I, I believe that. If some other nation had come in, it would be a sore feeling with us. But I said, I'm, that's, that's what man does. I said, I'm going to tell you there's somebody who loves you. That's Jesus Christ. And he'll be right there with you to the end of the road. They said, now, it was kind of odd. I asked for uh, a prayer line. Well, in those days when we first started, well, we did not give out prayer cards. That's the only way to keep order. And so I didn't have prayer cards. And I said, does anybody out there want to be prayed for? The interpreters said the same thing. Nobody moved. Well, I thought, my, I guess I want to have a prayer line. So in a few moments, the uh, Indian missionary went back uh, with the white missionary and picked up um, some people from the inside. The first one come out was a great, big, strong woman. As soon as she, I looked her in the face, many of you, best brother, Eddie's told you about the ministry. She had a social disease, not because that she was immoral, but because the way she had to live. And... When I told her that, she looked at me very strange. How did I know that? After it explained it in the scripture. The next was a little cross-eyed boy. Uh, I'll never forget it. And the mother uh, said, um, do you believe for the boy? And uh, the lady thought I asked what was wrong with the boy. So she just caught him by the hair and pulled him back. His little eyes were crossed. So I picked up the little fellow and gave him a cake of chewing gum. See, he couldn't understand English. Something or another to kind of get him quiet see which way the Holy Spirit was moving. Now I got him quietened and laid him up on my shoulder and I said, Heavenly Father, if I can find grace in your sight, let it be now. See, I said, I pray you straighten the little boy's eyes so that the people see there, they don't understand this and they must understand that you love them. And I no more than said that, I looked out and there was a vision the little boy I could see. I said, now, before I bring him from my shoulders, if this little boy's eyes isn't straight normally, I said, then, I- I'm a false prophet. But if they are straight, you'll believe God. And the interpreter said, yes. I never looked, just turned around like that, and there he was. <laughs> there he was, because his eyes as straight as he could be. So then, then the next come up was a little girl, and she belonged to one of the, I guess, one of the head men in the tribe, and uh, she was deaf and dumb. And uh, so I got him to get her to look up to me just a little bit. I said, yes. She's both deaf and dumb, and what caused it was a fever she had about four years ago and left her deaf and dumb. The interpreter asked, like, said that, and the lady nodded. The lady had had her, the Indian sister. That was right. And I said, now, I cannot give her her hearing. I'm, I'm only a servant. I cannot. Give. 
But if I will pray for her, do you believe God will heal her? She believed it. So I took the little girl up in my arms, and I prayed for her, and I set her down. And I told the interpreter, I said, now you just say in Indian, their language, the, the Apache language, what I say in English, all right? And I said, you love the Lord Jesus? And she said it. She looked at her real strange. She could hear it. And I said, uh, tell her to say what I said. And when I said that, she turned around and looked at me. She could hear it, see. And when she got back like this, I went, she turned and looked to see what was that. And I said, now tell her to say, I love Jesus. And she mumbled off something. I'd really never heard the language. I said, you know, she'll talk better after a while. And the lady was doing the interpreting, and she turned back to her talk plenty good now. <laughs> She's speaking her own language. <laughs> she talks plenty good now. Hey, now. You talk about a prayer line. <laughs> 200 ushers couldn't hold them, that's all. There was a prayer line I'd ever seen. It was like a stampede. And everybody wanted to get in the prayer line, and we couldn't stop it. And there was next coming out was an elderly lady. Now, they're very poor, but they're God's people. And she was very old, and she was supposed to be in the next in line coming this way. Only a young fellow, a little brave, just about so high, sturdy, built, real strong. He just broke through and run over everybody else, and he's going to be next. Well, we couldn't make him understand <laughs> So Brother Moore, a man was with me, just took, I had to take him by his arms and try to tell him that it wasn't right for him to do that. This lady was naked. Finally, they got him to understand. And the poor old lady, they brought her out of the room because these had started first. Let them come first. Well, here she come. And I noticed her. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, a pitiful the way she, she had two broomsticks cut off and a whole board up through a little piece of two before to make the cross part of the crutch with rags wrapped around it. And when she come out, she could only set those crutches like this, and then arthritis, see? She could move her legs like that, and then she'd set these crutches out. And she, I just stood still, let her come, and she got right up to me, and she looked up. Poor old thing was shaking with palsy. The great big, deep creases in her cheeks. When she looked up, her graying hair, leather wrapped in it as it hung down her back, the tears is making their way down through them wrinkles. I thought, somebody's mother yeah. stood there. And when she looked at me like that, I never said a word to her. She just kind of smiled. She reached over and got one of those crutches and put it with the other crutch, handed them up to me and went walking off that as good as anybody. <laughs> See? I said, how did you, asked her, how did she come to have that faith? She said, if him make cross eyes straight, him make legs straight. <laughs> That's good enough for her. Just simple faith. That's all it takes. When you try to figure it out, you can't figure out God. You got to believe God. You don't. You don't. Don't take an education that gets us away from God. The more we know an education, the further we go from God. That's the biggest hindrance the gospel's had is educating. Then they get to think they know more than God. But if you make yourself simple and just believe Him, that's all it takes. One more little thing before closing my testimony. I prayed all night long. It's coming along about 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning. I couldn't stand no more. I had to stop the discernment after 5 or 6. I was just laying hands on them. And I began to notice coming across. Now the, uh, the river runs right down through the reservation, and that's the Salt River. Coming down through the reservation, it gets pretty deep along in places. And I noticed the Indians coming in was wet way up around their waist. So I said, uh, what's the matter to the interpreter? And she said, uh, they thought you were false to begin with. I said, but they know it's truth now, and they're packing their loved ones. The Ford's about 15 miles down here, but they're walking right on across this way with their loved ones, packing them in through the night, just to be there one night. Next in line coming in, coming up over the platform, was an old man that made a stretcher to pack him on. They took a board about this wide, and it... Uh, put a stick across it this way and a stick this way. And then it took the old man and laid him up on there, and one leg hung over one end of the stick, and then his arms like that. This two great, big, fine-looking young man packing him. They stand there, and their lips blue, shivering. It's cold on the desert. It gets real cold early in the morning like that. They were shivering, waiting. I seen them coming up in the line. I kept praying for the people, and just laying hands on them, praying as they come by. So this fellow stood up there. He was shivering, holding like that, the old man. I said, you're wet. Said, looked at me and I said, You speak English? He said, Little. I said, uh, Aren't you afraid you take pneumonia? Nope. 
said, Jesus Christ says, take care of me. I brought my dad. Mm. I said, who's that on the other end? My brother. I said, bring him by. He couldn't speak English. The fellow had palsy, shaking like this, which seemed to be a great disease among that in Lacombe. So I, uh, I said, uh, sir, do you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? And his son said that to him. You know, he nodded his head. He did. I said, all right. If you believe now, just simple faith, God will make you well. And I laid my hands up on him. I said, Heavenly Father, there, Daddy. No doubt what he struggled many days to make food for them boys. I said, now they, they believe, and they packed him across that river there. And, and from way out in the reservation, probably been hours getting him here, I said, sure, I believe that you'll make him well. In the name of the Lord Jesus, I ask that I lay my prayer upon your altar and believe. And I said, all right, now you take him home and don't doubt. Thank you. Started off. I said, next one. Brought the next one up. After a while, I heard somebody. I was on this porch making a noise and all the Indians screaming and shouting. I looked down there. <laughs> the old man had the board on his own shoulders going out waving everybody. <laughs> I didn't see why I like to minister to Indians. They believe. Now, I won't... I'm here to say this, my, my brother, sister, and to the white people, too. These are all of them. We are here in the country and the climates and so forth, changing our colors of skin. God, by one blood, made all man. We all come from Adam. Whether we are white, brown, black, yellow, red, whatever we are, we are all off of one tree, Adam, God's first man. And therefore... We are as pilgrims everywhere. I've been around the world several times, and I've never seen yet or we ever found people who love God, but what they were wonderful people. I've been down where they didn't even know which is right and left hand. They never even know to wear clothes. They were stripped naked. No nothing. Didn't even know they were naked. Men, women, boys, girls. They never know nothing about it. But stand there and let them receive Christ. And receive the Holy Ghost, and they do the same things you do. <laughs> Without being told, they do it anyhow. <laughs> it goes to show that the Holy Spirit is universal. See, it's everywhere. It's the same all around the world. So when that great time comes, when our Jesus does arrive, there will be one and two in the bed, or it's nighttime. I'll take one and leave one. Two in the field, or it's daylight on the other side of the world. I'll take one and leave one. <laughs> See, it'll be. Everywhere, the resurrection, a great rapture of the church will come, and we'll all go home together. Then the old will turn back young, and oh, it'll be a wonderful time. Amen. Now, Christian friends, and uh, to Brother Eddie and the staff of minister brothers here, and to you out there, we are not here to represent any certain denominational church. We are here in behalf of the love of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. We are here not to make members of any certain church, but of the church. And there's only one church after all, and that's the church of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we do not join it by one spirit. We are all baptized into one body, which is the church of Christ. Yes, and that's how we become Christians. And we love him, and I know every, the rest of them does. Now, we do have organizations, denominations. Them's all right. That's fine. But as long as you don't draw a line and say, we are it and you're not, see, it, we're, we're all it if we're baptized into the body. And um, I said, I've been with the Branham family now for over 50 years, and they never did ask me to join the family. You know why? I was born in it. <laughs> I, I, was, I was a Branham by birth, and that's the way we become a Christian. It's by birth. No matter what church we belong to, we are Christians by birth. And then by birth brings his life into us and produces his life through us, you see. Now, you, if you could take the sap, the life, out of an apple tree and put it in a grapevine, that grapevine would bear apples. See, because the life that was bears apples, the germ is in the life, and it would bear apples on the grapevine. Depends on what kind of a life is on the inside of it, see? That's right. Now, if you could take a peach tree and a pear tree and take the, uh, the life out of the peach tree, just take out all the life and put it over into the pear tree, 
Every bit of the life, no more pear tree life in it, but peach tree life, it would bear peach leaves and have it have peach leaves and bear peaches. Because it's got peach tree life in it. And no matter how bad the sinner is, how wicked, how bad they are, how much of an unbeliever, if you can just take all that old unbelieving life out of him, see, put the life of Christ in him, you'll be a different person. Right? He sure will. He'll sure be a different person. And I believe the Bible to be God's Word. See, I believe that it's perfect and, it, and there can be nothing taken from it or nothing added to it. Now, background, I'm Irish by descent, so therefore my people were Catholic. But in our church, my own home, they never married in the church till they belonged to nothing. And that's why I got my calling. You probably got the books and read them of the, my life story. And then I was called to this ministry. Now, when I first became a Christian, or to believe on Christ, from a little boy, it started with me when I was, first when I was born. When I was born, that light that you see in the picture here was hanging over the cradle where I was born. Way up in the mountains with not even a, a wooden floor, just dirt. And we didn't even have a, they didn't even have a table. Papa cut a piece of a stump off and put legs on it for a table. And I had a little bed made out of corn shucks. I don't know where, you know what, the husk off of the corn, the shuck. And they made the pillar and bed out of that. And that's where I was born on five o'clock one morning and didn't even have glass in the window, just a little door you push out. And, and then that light come in and it goes to show that God don't have to have a palace to come to. It's the humble home. Anybody that will believe. And now I believe the Word of God is so perfect that we cannot misinterpret it. We must just teach it the way it is and live it the way it's taught. Now, I, I believe now, now like the priest told me, he said, God will judge the world by the church. Or if it's by the church, which one is the church? The Catholic one side, is Roman Catholic says we are, the Greek Catholic says we are, and oh my, the different, uh, different Catholic phases, which one of them is right? See? And then you say, well, then the Lutheran says we're the church, the Baptist says we're the church, the Methodist says we're the church, the Pentecostal says we're the church, the, uh, well, there's 960 different denominations. So which one is the church? It'd be very confusing, see? But God will judge the people by his word. Well, yeah. oh, that's the word. Now, over in the book of Revelation, it said, Whosoever shall take out anything out of the book or add anything to it, the same will be, his part will be taken from the book of life. Now, I believe it's so perfect that the reason we got death today, sorrow, sickness, these graveyards out here, every man that ever died, every little suffering baby, every sickness was because when Eve failed to believe that God's word was sufficient, she mistrusted God's word and that brought death. God gave his church, God cannot change. So God gave his church the best thing and when God ever makes a decision, he can never say, I was wrong. See? Do you understand it? Amen. Look, God, maybe I talk too loud. I, I hope I don't. I, God, God can never change his decision. When I say anything or you say anything, we're finite. That means just human. And we say next year we learn more than we know the year before. I, I see, I, I get smarter. You do. Each one of us does. But not God. He's infinite. That means he's perfect to begin with. Every decision is perfect. He can never change his. Look, so you're not misunderstanding. In the Garden of Eden, when man first sinned and disassociated, cut himself off from God, fellowship with God. Now, he tried to make himself a religion. He sold some leaves together to cover himself up. But his man-made religion wouldn't work. And God made a decision of the offering of blood. He killed some animals, took the skins and covered them up. Now that was God's decision in the Garden of Eden to save man and to fellowship with man through the shed blood of an innocent being. And he's never changed it. Amen. 
We'll never be able to come to a place to say we all must be Luther, we all must be Catholic, we all must be this or that, but one place God meets man, and that's on the basis of the shed blood, Amen. the blood of Jesus Christ, his son. It was so at the beginning. In Israel, man met only God, only met man under the shed blood. In the days of Job, only the shed blood. All down through the history, it's been shed blood because that was God's first recognition to man. How to save him by the blood. See, when God wants act, he's called to the scene to act. Now, don't forget this. When God is one time called to on the scene to act the way he acts the first time, every time that, that case is called again or any case similar to it, he's got to act the same way he did the first time, or he acted wrong yes. when he acted first. Yes. Now, do you understand real clear? Do my Indian friends understand that real clear? Look. In other words, if, if a man sinned and God said, I'll... I'll save him under the shed blood. That's, now, the next man comes, he's got to save him too. The next man, next man, every man. Yeah. And then, if a man's sick, and God healed the first man on the basis of his faith in God. That's the way God healed the first man. Yeah. Uh, now, every man that comes afterward, he, uh, with faith believing, God's got to do the same thing. Yeah. If he didn't, he acted wrong on the first man. Yeah. Now, you know what I mean? He was yeah. wrong when he acted first. See, so he's got to act the same each time. Now, you say, well, now, maybe this didn't mean that. Don't you never believe that? Every word that God spoke, he means eternally. Yeah. See, yeah. the word is God. See, yeah. so it cannot fail. Now, you say, well, it doesn't make any difference. Yes, it does, friend. Now, look, when Lot was called out of Sodom, you people remember the story? Yeah. Sure. Now, the angel said to Lot and his wife, his family, don't look back. And now think of that mother, Lot's wife. Her children were burning up down there in the judgments of God. Her grandchildren were burning up in the judgments of God. And she merely turned her head to look back, and she stands there yet today as a pillar of salt. We know that. See? It does make a difference. Yes. When God says anything, he means just what he says. Amen. Now, how many in this building, both Indian and white, that believe that God means just exactly what he says? He, he cannot change. He means what he says. All right. Now, now before we approach his word, now I want, I'll speak to you just a little bit on the word. Now, we'll never leave the word. We'll say, I believe the word. God can do many things that he hasn't written in his Bible, but as long as I, if I just see him do what he's written, that's enough for me. Just let him, just write like that. I, I believe that then we know we're right. Now to my ministering brethren here, the clergyman. So it, uh, they're your, that's your pastors. Now in the Old Testament, God had a way of finding out, or the people had a way of finding out whether a message is right or not. Now, when a prophet prophesied, or a dreamer dreamed a dream, they took him down to the temple where Aaron's breastplate was and had all them breast stones, twelve. And when this prophet prophesied against that stone, or the dreamer told his dream, if that's called the Urim Thundum. And if them lights didn't flash over that Urim Thundum, then no matter how real it sounds, it was wrong. The Urim of Thundam had to speak whether it was right or wrong. You know that, man. That's right. Well, now, that was for the Levitical priesthood. Now, what God did there, now, he never changes, remember. He can't change. He has to stay. Now, Jesus, when he come, he said, you've heard them of old times, thou shalt not kill. But I say that whosoever is angry with his brother, without a cause, has killed already. Is that right? Yes. Now, see, he never, he never changed it. He just magnified it, made it greater. He said, you've heard them of old times, thou shalt not commit adultery. He had to be in the act to be guilty. He said, but I say to you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her already in his heart. Yes. See, he brought her from the real act to a lust for the act. See, made it greater. Now, when the Urim Thundum from the breastplate of Aaron was changed, it was brought to the word. 
Heavens and earth will pass away, but my word shall not pass away. See, then it must be according to the word. Now, let us bow our heads just a moment for prayer. And we're going to, to approach him. Now, just in the eve of this three nights meeting with you lovely people, I wonder among you tonight, is there a request that you'd like to be remembered before God? She's saying like this, God, you know my heart. I have something I have need of. I'm going to raise up my hand. And God, before this meeting ends, this three night meeting, give me healing for my body or for my sister, for my brother, for, for my mother, father, or for salvation or whatever you have need of. If you've got such a need, would you just raise up your hand to God? Just let it be known as you raise your hand and say, God, remember me. All right. Now let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we are approaching thy throne of grace. We would not come by the throne of judgment, the throne of justice. We cannot stand there. For justly, we should not have the right to come, for we were sinners. But we come by the throne of grace, which you told us we had rights to come. And now, Heavenly Father, you know the, what's behind these hands that raised up. Down beneath there was a heart, and in that heart was a request. God, grant that before these three nights shall pass, that every one of them shall be answered. Grant it. Save the lost. Heal the sick, Lord. Now, we know that you were wounded for our transgressions. With your stripes, we were healed. Now, we realize, Heavenly Father, that when you died for our sins, then every sin in the world was forgiven. But it'll never help us until we accept him as our Savior from that sin. But the sin question has been settled when Jesus Christ, the Son of God, died to take away the sin of the world. And we are taught that by his stripes we were healed. Now we know that healing has already been settled in the face of God because his own Son was striped for our healing. With his stripes we were healed. And we know that we can accept healing when we believe it, just like we accept salvation. Now, Father, will you come into our midst and let us know that you are raised from the dead, that you're living today, and there, you still remain the same loving Jesus, and at the time of joining us, looking upon the earth at these sights that's coming, you said that was the time to lift up the head for our redemption's drawing nigh. The prophet told us there would be a day that could not be called night or day. It'd be a dismal day, a lot of fog. But in the evening time, it shall be light. And the same sun that rises in the east is the same one that sets in the west. The same S-U-N that crosses the sky. And the same S-O-N of God that come in the east and poured out the Holy Spirit in this last days in the evening time over here on the west coast as pulled back the fog and poured out the Holy Ghost to give evening light just as the sun. Thank thee for it, Father. And now, I'm up here among the sojourners of the, these precious people that dwelling here looking for the coming of the Lord. Now, we pray that you'll magnify yourself before us in such a way that we'll know that you're here. And when we leave tonight to go to our different homes, may we stay like those who came from Emmaus that day after the resurrection. You walked with them all day, and they didn't know you. And when you got them in the evening time and take them on the inside and close the doors, then you did something the way you did it before you were crucified, and they know no one could do it like you, and that was you. So they rushed over and said, Truly, the Lord is risen. Did not our hearts burn within us as he talked to us along the way? Grant it, Lord, tonight as we go to our homes, may we see the risen Lord Jesus right here in this building, healing the sick and showing mercy to all. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Now, over in the blessed old Bible, and just for a text, and now I want you to listen real close now, and I'll just take my time and try to explain this the best that I can. Now, if you'll catch this real close, now, all my 
Indian friends know English. Is that right? They all can speak English. Good. Everybody in here speaks English. The Norwegians and what more, you see. I want you to really, I was going to say it to didn't, and I had somebody come and interpret, because I don't want you to miss this. Now, you're such a nice audience, I could just stand and talk for hours, and, and I, I love you, because I know you love our Lord. Now, I want to read two places out of the Scripture, and one of them is found in St. John 12, 20, the 12th chapter and the 21st. The other one is our theme of our campaign, Hebrews 13, 8. Now, this is just a little formal message that we usually introduce to service. And then we'll pray for the sick, and then tomorrow, maybe, you'll understand better. Remember, come to the church early, and now there'll be a boy here, my son, or Brother Eddie, or Brother Roy, or some of them. Somebody will be here with prayer cards. And they bring these prayer cards up before you, mix them all up together, and go down and give everybody a prayer card. So that the boy that mixes them up, he will have nothing to do with what prayer card is given. Then when I come to the meeting, we never know just where the prayer line will start. We might start at 50, we might start at 20, we might start at 10, we might start at 1, we might start at 100 and come back. Just anyway, anyone's ever attended the meetings, you brethren I guess have, know that that is true. So therefore, then you don't have to have the prayer card. If you just got faith, there's usually about ten in the audience healed where one's healed on the platform. You just have faith and believe. Amen. Now, St. John, the 12th chapter, 21st. And there were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. The same came, therefore, to Philip, which was of Bethsaida, and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. Now, in Hebrews 13, 8, it said, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. Now, I'm going to make a text out of that and say this, Sir, we would see Jesus. Now, how many would like to see him? Let's see your hands. Just how many? Now, thank you for your interest of seeing our Lord. Now, as I told you, I believe the Bible is God's Word, and it must be just exactly what God says, and He has to keep every promise, or it isn't God's Word. Yeah. If, it, if, that, if He don't keep His promise, then it's, it's not God's Word. God couldn't be God make a promise and then not keep it. See? No, no. That would be man. That would be a man-made book. But God's book is God's Word. Now... Now, these Greeks had heard of Jesus, but they had never seen Jesus. And they came to one of Jesus' disciples, which the name was Philip of Bethsaida in Galilee, and said, Sir, we would see Jesus. Now, he was Jesus' servant, so he took him before Jesus and showed him Jesus. Now... The Bible said here, Paul writing in Hebrews 13, 8, that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. You all believe that? Amen. All right. Now, if those Greeks wanted to see Jesus, and you want to see Jesus, and one of God's servants took and showed them Jesus, and if he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, why couldn't God's servant show him to you today? Amen. If he's the same. Amen. Well, you say, but he died. Yes, but he raised again. Amen. See? He's not dead. He's a living. Amen. See? He isn't dead. He's alive. Now, his corporal body, that's the flesh, was taken up before God, set on the throne of God. And the Holy Spirit came back down, which was the Spirit of Christ, and lived in the church. You believe that, don't you? Now, if we would ask this question, Sir, we would see Jesus. And now, if Jesus, the, I, being a missionary, I travel everywhere around the world, and I was just in Bombay, India, here not long ago, where I was entertained in the temple of the Jains, the Jain religion, 
And there were 17 different religions represented in that temple that afternoon to speak to me. And every one of them was against Christianity. Now think of it. They worshiped idols, uh, animals, and uh, some of them believe in reincarnation. That is, you die one thing and come back another. It's the awfulest mess you've ever seen. But when our Lord Jesus come on the scene, Amen. I did it. I took this same text before 500,000 that night. That's a half a million people sitting in a great big stadium, uh, ample theater like, and took that same text where Mohammedans and Buddhists, Sikhs, Jain, oh my, every different kind you could think. And the Rajah sitting on silk pillars, the mayor of Durban was there, and, and Hatma Gandhi's boy was there, and, and all, uh, so many. And there, when the Holy Spirit began to reveal to the people. Glory. And then came a man, and they thought it was a telepathy. Then came a blind man to the platform with his prayer card, the fourth person, and I saw a vision that he was going to be made well. Amen. And I challenged every religion on the ground to come give him his sight. And I said, if I says telepathy, you come give him his sight. I said, then why don't you come? The Mohammedan priest, why don't you come? I said, you think I wouldn't nothing. I wouldn't say that for anything. I'd be afraid to say it. But I just saw a vision that he's got his sight. Now, if he doesn't, then I'm a false prophet. If he does, how many will accept Christ as Savior? Just oceans of hands. I said, come here, sir. And it told him he was a, been blind so many years, and he's a beggar, and so forth, and all about how many children he had, and so that was all right. But they still believed it was a telepathy, like a mind reading thing. And so I said, now, mind reading, it, I know nothing about psychology. I said, and anybody that knows psychology would never call that psychology. So then they, uh, I said, now, if that's so, you professors of psychology come here and give him his sight. <laughs> Is a mighty quiet group. <laughs> I said, I said, you Mohammedans are the predominating religions of the world. That's right, there are more Mohammedans than any. And I said, why don't your priests come up here then and give him his sign? I said, what about you Buddhists? Buddha lived about 2,300 years ago, a Chinese philosopher, or a Japanese philosopher. I said, now, why don't you come and give him his sign? I said, I was in the temple this afternoon, the James. There is the... That like the Pope, the highest man of them. You come give him his sight, I'll join your religion. Nobody said that. <laughs> I said, what's the matter with you? <laughs> I said, now, if this is telepathy, then you come, you're masters at it. I'm not. Come give him his sight. Amen. See? <laughs> Praise the Lord. I said, if Muhammad is, somebody's got to be right and somebody's got to be wrong. We can't all be right. That's true. I said, let the God that's the God of creation create him a sight. Amen. Anyone know where this right or not? And I said, I wouldn't say that if I hadn't already saw he was going to receive his sight. But I said, he is. And if he doesn't, then you turn me out of India. I'm a false prophet. If he does, you receive him. I motioned to him to come there. No more. And I prayed he screamed. He see as good as I could. <laughs> I said, sure. And then they had to, I couldn't even get out of the building and things like that. They had, to, they had even a militia soldiers there. Oh, I guess 15, 1,600 soldiers before I could ever get to the car two hours later. And... Um, but what is it, friends? God, if he ever was God, he's still God. Yeah. And if he isn't the same God, then there's something wrong. He couldn't have been God to begin with. So, see, so he's, he's, he's got to ever remain the same. Now, now, if we say, sir, we would see Jesus. Now, if I say to the Lutherans here tonight, what do you think about it? Oh, sure, I believe it's the same. Baptist, Presbyterian, Pentecostals, Catholic, whatever more. it all be yes, he's in our church. And th we got him. Well, this is ours. He, he's our God. He, he's with us. Well, I, I believe that too. I'm going to believe that with you. But now, just a minute. There's only one way to make that thing right. There's only one way to correctly know is to find out what he was yesterday. Yes. Yes. See? Ever what he was yesterday, he's got to be the same today. Lord, amen. Is that right? Amen. See, it isn't whether... Now, we wouldn't go down to town to find a man, look around, we'd say, Jesus Christ is with us. We wouldn't go downtown to find a man had on a robe and nail scars across his head or thorn prints and nail scars in his hand. Any hypocrite could do that. Yeah. See? See? It takes a life in him to do it. See? His life. The life of the man 
Jesus said here in St. John, He that believeth on me, though, St. John 14, uh, 12, He that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. Cause his life. If we were a cedar tree and had a Christ tree put in us, then that life would bear fruit. Just as that, like the peach tree to the pear tree, or so forth, the apple tree to whatever it was. Is that right? Amen. See? You'd have to see what he was yesterday. Now, Paul speaking here, was speaking of yesterday, means the Old Testament. What he was yesterday, he is today and will be forever. That's the Old Testament, the New Testament, and forevermore. Amen. Same yesterday, today, and forever. See? Now, what was he yesterday? Now, if he was a, if he was a great rich man yesterday, he'd be a great rich man today. But when he come yesterday, we find out that he didn't even have a place to lay his head. Right. The birds of the air have nests, the foxes has dens, but I don't even have a place to lay my head. He, he had, when he come to the world, he bought a womb to be born in. He had no cradle to lay him in, so they laid him in a box of straw. When he died, he was nailed to a Roman tree under capital punishment. He had one robe to put on. It had been made for him, wove throughout, without a seam. He had to borrow a grave to be buried in. So there's none of us that bad off. He come to show what God was. Anything that's high and haughty isn't God. God is low and humble. That's what made him God. See? Something that comes low. Not then it goes high. So God doesn't dwell in our, uh, hierarchies and things. He dwells in humility. The way up is down. Humble yourself and you'll be exalted. Exalt yourself and you'll be humble. That's right. See? God knows how to do it. So you have to remember, humble yourself before God. Don't try to think your own thoughts. Think His thoughts. See? And the whole Christian armor now is unseen. The Christian looks at what he doesn't see. Natural. Now look, that's the only way you can be a Christian. You've got to believe God who you can't see. See? Now look. Watch here. The whole Christian armor is love, joy, faith, long-suffering, patience, meekness, gentleness, Holy Spirit. See? All those things are unseen. They're unseen, but the things that's unseen is the ones that has the reality. The unseen thing. Now, we'll take Jesus. We all know his birth. I was predicted from the Garden of Eden. A seed of the woman should bruise the serpent's head and bruise the heel and so forth. Now... But when he came, he was born in a manger, and he raised up in a humble home, and then went to live with some people, Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. And at the age of 30 years old, John the baptizer baptized him in the river of Jordan, and God came down in the form of the Holy Spirit, in the Holy Spirit, in the form of a dove, and went in him and dwelt in him. I remember God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Is that right? All right. Not me, said Jesus, doeth the works, but my Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Now, if you're putting scriptures down, St. John 5, 19, Jesus said, Very, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing in himself, but what he sees the Father doing. That doeth the Son likewise. Now remember, not what he hears the Father saying, but what he sees the Father doing. Therefore, Jesus never did nothing until God showed him by a vision what to do first. Amen. If he did, the Scripture's wrong. St. John 5, 19. That verily I say unto you, that means absolutely, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing in himself, but what he sees the Father doing, that doeth the Son likewise. For the Father worketh, and I worketh hitherto. In other words, he just acted out in drama what God the Father showed him to do, because God was in Christ. Yes. Amen. Now, Matthew 3, it said, This is my beloved Son. When he was coming down, a voice speaking from that God that was coming down like a dove. John bare record seeing it, and a voice come from it said, This is my beloved Son, in whom, in whom I am pleased to dwell. 
And if I was going to make it so you'd understand it better, that's the early translators in King James. If you get the original Greek, it reads like this. This is my beloved son in whom I'm pleased to dwell in. But you see, it's the same thing. In whom I'm pleased to dwell. See? I am pleased to dwell in my son. Then he became Emmanuel, God, with us. Now, now, in, now St. John, I read from you, St. John 12, 20. Now, let's go back to St. John and start, and just stay in St. John tonight, showing what the scriptures are in St. John about him. Now, we'll see if we can find out what he was tonight. Tomorrow night, we'll go a little deeper in it, and next night, just keep going. Notice now. St. John, let's, we read the 12th chapter. Let's go back and read the first chapter now. It said, Now, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. How can you get it? In the beginning was the Word. Now, what is the Word? A Word is a thought expressed. You have to think it before you say it, see? And in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And if the Word ever was God, it's still God. Amen. See? Yeah. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. St. John, the first chapter. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. The Word of God was made flesh among us in Christ Jesus. You believe that? Amen. He was the Word of God. Made flesh. Now, and Jesus said in St. John, the first chapter, also in the 10th chapter and 37th verse, He said, If I do not the works of my Father, then don't believe me. In other words, what the Father had expressed that He was, if He didn't do that, then don't believe Him. That's only sensible. Yes. See? And in St. John 5, 39, said, Search the Scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they that testify of me. Amen. In other words, he was the living word. Amen. He was God's word made manifest. Oh, how I like to, to get into that. God's word made manifest. In other words, made known. God's Word made known. In other words, He was the one that God lived in to make His Word known. Yeah. Christ expressed what the Word taught. Amen. Yeah. There you are. Christ was the expression of the Word that was wrote. Christ expressed it. No wonder He said to those Pharisees, religious leaders of His days, He said, You hypocrites. Said, if the sun sets clear, you say it's going to be pretty tomorrow. If it's red low and you say it be foul weather. Said, you can discern the face of the skies, but the sign of the time you cannot discern. For if you had known me, you would have known my day. Yes. They had religion, oh my, plenty of it. But they failed to see him as the Messiah. Because, now you know he didn't come the wrong way. He come exactly the way the word predicted it. But not according to what they were thinking. They had it some other way. But he come exactly the way the Bible predicted he would come, only they had the Bible misinterpreted. Yes. Yes. I wonder if it could be so again. Yes. No doubt. Well, there's too many different interpretations to it. So you can see there's got to be something wrong somewhere. Yes. <laughs> some of them says there's no such a thing as divine healing. Others says the days of the miracles is past. The Holy Ghost only fell on the twelve apostles and and others say one thing. There's got to be something right and something wrong somewhere. <laughs> That's right. And remember, before you can have, if you've got a bogus dollar, that's a counterfeit dollar. Before that counterfeit dollar can be made, there has to be a real dollar it's made off of. If it didn't, it's the original one. There's got to be a real religion that's made off of. Amen. Exactly right. Every one of them started off. He just went different ways and got away from the Word. And that's the reason. Today, how can we expect God to ever perform and bring the church back to a Pentecostal experience when we deny the very fact that He does it? Yes. 
As I've often said, it's what good would it do to feed the canary bird good vitamin seeds to make big, strong wings and good feathers and then keep him in a cage? <laughs> Wouldn't do no good, would it? No. Certainly not. If you're going to feed him vitamins and make his wings strong, turn him loose, let him fly. That's what we got to do. We need some canary bird flying. That's right. Turn loose. And them things that we believe about God, use that thing. Certainly. Certainly. We believe it. Don't pin him back and say, oh, the days of miracles is past. No, it isn't. It's past for them who believe it's past. But to them who know better, it's different. <laughs> fellow said to me not long ago, so I don't care what you'd say, how many people you would have produced that I still don't believe in divine healing. No, sir. I said, certainly not. It wasn't for unbelievers. It was only for believers. <laughs> That's all. It's just for those who believe. That's all. Now, we find Jesus now has come to express the word. Now, that's what he was yesterday. That's what he is today. That's what he will be forever. God's word made known. Is that a better word? Thank you. God's word expressed, showed that it's truth. And everything that God said he would do, he did it. Everything that's wrote in the Bible of him doing, he done it. Just exactly because he was the word expressed. Well, if he's the same yesterday today and forever and all these promises hanging to this generation, why wouldn't he be the same today to express everything that God's word promised? It has to be exactly the same. Because that's what he was then, that's what he is now, that's what he will be forever. God's word expressed. Hey, Amen. Even in the great millennium, you'll still be God's word expressed. Oh, how that ought to kindle our faith, see, to know that it's there. And if he is the Holy Spirit to light upon that word, now the word is the seed. Now most of you brethren are, are here, I suppose, farm. And you put a seed in the ground, and there, next morning you go out and dig it up and say, my corn ain't growing yet. Put it back, cover it up. Next morning I'll see if it's growing again. It never will grow like that. No, no. Every time you dig it up, you delay it. Isn't that right? What do you do? You know the earth was made to grow the corn. Is that right? Or the, or the, the seed. And you plant the seed, commit it to the earth, and forget about it. God does the rest of it. Amen. Well, that's what you do with the Word of God. Amen. You just plant it, don't dig it up, just keep on believing it. Commit it to God. He makes it grow. That's kind of, see? Any promise that God makes, you just, you just plant it in your heart and say, it's mine. God gave it to me. See? Now, you may not see any results right now. You ever seen your corn crop since you planted your corn? <laughs> but potentially it's there. As long as you leave it alone and keep watering it, it'll, it'll grow. Don't worry about that. It'll take, if it's a germatized seed. And every word of God is germatized by God Himself. God is in the Word. So it will grow. You know it will. There you are. We have to take His Word, accept it, believe it, commit it, and it grows. That's right. But don't keep digging it up now. You'll ruin it. You'll ruin your crop every time you do that. So just commit it to God and believe it. Now, for instance, like, um, say, for instance, I was up here on top of the mountain somewhere, marooned. And uh, I had nothing to eat. And before I could get anything to eat, it, a loaf of bread would save my life. And the purchase price of a loaf of bread, say, 25 cents. Well, I'd say, somebody come out and say, what's the matter, Brother Brown? I'm starving to death. I'm going to die. Why? I haven't got no bread. Well, you say, why don't you get some bread? I haven't got no money. Well, a loaf of bread's worth 25 cents. Yes, sir, but I haven't got 25 cents. See? Well, you say, here, Brother Branham, take this 25 cents and get you a loaf of bread. Oh, my. I just, I just dance a little jig all around. Why? I can be just as happy with a quarter in my hand to buy the loaf of bread as it would be with a loaf of bread. Because I have got the purchasing power for the loaf of bread. Just right there's the store. All I have to do is lay it down and I get the loaf of bread. So I can be just as happy with the quarter in my hand as I could with the loaf of bread because it's the buying power of the loaf of bread. So what is the evidence of your healing when you believe it? No matter what takes place, you say, I don't feel better, I don't want to have nothing to do with it. You've got the purchase power and you believe it. So you just start saying some little jigs and praise God, I'm going to be well because I've got the purchasing power of that loaf of bread. There you are. Now there's no one can heal you. Because you're already healed. How many knows that the Bible teaches that? You're already healed. By stripes you were healed. See? 
Now, uh, no man can heal you. You can't. If Jesus stood here himself, he couldn't heal you. He's already done it. See? That's exactly right. You'd have to believe it. Now, when he was made manifest and see what he was yesterday, let's carry it just a little further. Now, we know that the prophets of the Old Testament, God always had his people to believe his prophets. We know that, don't we? Because the Bible said that the word of God, the word now, which was God, came to the prophets. Is that right? Yeah. The word of the Lord came to the prophets. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. The word of the Lord came to Moses. The word of the Lord came the way. to the prophets. was the one who had the word of God. And they, by having it, they manifested it. Yeah. See? They manifested because it come to them. They had it. They spoke it, told exactly what would happen, and it happened. Amen. That's the way they know they were prophets. Yeah. Now, you get it? Yeah. See? The word came to the prophets, portion, not all of it, just part of it, would come to the prophets, and he would express exactly what the word was, and it happened just the way he said it. Yeah. And God said, if there be one among you who's spiritual or a prophet, I, the Lord, will make myself known to him in visions, speak to him through dreams. And if this prophet prophesies, and what he says comes to pass, then hear that prophet, for I am with him. That's the word in him. Amen. You get it? Amen. But if he prophesies and it don't come to pass, then don't fear that prophet, for I ain't with him. But you see, if it does come to pass, then that proves that it was God's word in the prophet. He said it and it happened. Now, they always was to believe their prophets. Now, in Deuteronomy, the 18th chapter, Moses, who gave the law to Israel, he said, told them about the end time, and he said, The Lord your God shall raise up among you of your brethren a prophet like me. It shall come to pass that whosoever will not hear that prophet will be cut off from the people. Now, that, then we know that he was speaking of the Messiah. Because all down through the e John, art thou that prophet? Art thou that prophet? They kept it. Art thou that prophet? See? Because they know that prophet was coming. Now, the last prophet of the Old Testament was Malachi, 400 and something years before the coming of Christ. Now, all at once, Christ comes on the scene. And he's baptized in Jordan by John. The Father comes down in the form of the Holy Spirit, goes in him. In the wilderness he goes to be tempted of the devil 40 days and comes back out with his ministry. Let's watch what he was now. How we see what he was. What he was in the prophets, we found out. Now we're going to find out what he is. What well, it was yesterday, then we, as Paul said today, then we find out what he will be forever. See? Yeah. Now, here he comes out. The first thing we find him doing, there was a man named Simon. And he had a brother named Andrew. And Andrew had been attending John's meeting. And he, John said, There is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And Andrew went with him. And he was thoroughly convinced that that was the Messiah. So he come told his fisherman brother, Simon, that we know by the name of Peter, told him, he said, I found the Messiah. Come see him. Now I can imagine, that's just breaking to see what Simon must have thought. He said, Now wait a minute here. Now, I am a Bible reader. My old daddy, before he died, he told me, Son, there's going to be everything before the Messiah comes, because there's always a bunch of false raises up to counteract the, the right. We know that, all ages. Now, he said, now there'll be all kinds of people wanting to be Messiahs, and that's Jesus, the Savior. said, there'll be many of them, but said, don't you be deceived, stay with the Word, for that Messiah will be that king prophet. You'll know him because he'll do the sign of the prophet. See? For Moses, our scripture told us that the Messiah that was going to be raised up among us would be a prophet like him. Amen. The Word of God would be with him. He would be manifesting the Word of God. Amen. Amen. You get it? Amen. The Word of the Lord would be with him because he'd be a prophet and he'd be manifesting the, the Word of the Lord. And that's the reason Jesus said, search the scriptures. In them you think you've got eternal life and they testify me. And if I don't do them works, then don't believe me. But if you can't believe me being a man, believe the works that I do, that you might be saved. Perfect. Now they were looking for this prophet to raise up. And when, of course, Andrew come running in and tell him, oh, he might have thought, Andrew, you've gone off on the deep end. So one day he walked down to find Jesus at the shore. And when he walked up in the presence of Jesus, 
Now remember, Simon, his name was Simon then, but when he walked in the presence of Jesus for the first time, Jesus had never seen him. Now watch him now. As soon as he walked into his presence, Jesus looked around at him and said, Your name is Simon, and you are the son of Jonas. Oh, my. That got him. Oh, he not only knew who he was, but he knew that God, the old father of his. Yes. So there was a prophet. No one could deny it. There he was doing just exactly. He knew him and knew his daddy. He said, your name is Simon. You are the son of Jonas. And I'm going to call you, from henceforth, I'm going to call you Peter, which means little stone, confession, because Peter is confessing. Now there was one standing there by the name of, of Philip. One we just read about taking this man to Jesus. He's seen that. And he thought, say, that seals it. Because the Bible said that that Messiah would be a prophet, and here he is. We see. So he had a friend that he studied the Bible with, the old scrolls. And his name was Nathaniel. So from where Jesus is preaching, if you're ever there, it's 15 miles around the mountain here to where Nathaniel lived. So Philip took off and run around here that day, and the next morning he picked up Nathaniel in the garden praying. And he said, Come see who we found. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Well, he, they'd studied the scriptures together since boys. Went to the same church. And he said, Now, wait a minute here. Just a minute. Could there be any good thing come out of Nazareth? He said, Come see. Could something like that come out? Now, that's a, good, that's a good answer to anybody. Don't stay home and criticize it. Come find out. Amen. That goes good yet today. Come see for yourself. Here they go around the bend, coming around. He said, now look, do you remember that old man named Simon that couldn't write his name when you, he bought some fish from you and you couldn't give, he couldn't give a receipt? Oh, yeah, the son of Jonas? Yes. Yesterday, he came up before the Messiah. And we know him Messiah. He had never seen him in all of his life. And he said, behold, your name is Simon and you're the son of Jonas. Now, look, we both know the Scriptures. And doesn't our Bible tell us that the Messiah would be a prophet? And here he is doing this. Ah, Philip couldn't believe that or Nathaniel. So he'd come up in the presence of Jesus. And when he walked up in the presence of Jesus, Jesus looked right at him and said, Behold, an Israelite in whom there's no God. In other words, a righteous man. And astonished him. He said, Rabbi, which means teacher. Rabbi, when did you ever know me? You've never seen me. Why, well, I'm from another part of the country. I just come in here. You never see me. How do you know I'm a righteous man? He said, before Philip called you, when you were under the tree, I saw you. What a... You know what that Bible scholar said? He said, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Why? Wow. He saw he was exactly the manifestation of God's Word. Four hundred years without a prophet, and here he stood. Exactly what the Bible said he would do. Rabbi, teacher, you are the Son of God. You're the King of Israel. Jesus said, because I told you this, you believe. And come on, follow me. You'll see greater than this. You see. All right. Oh, that was Jesus yesterday. Now, there's only three races of people in the whole world, if we believe the Bible. Oh, I know they claim as many, but look, we all sprung from after the antediluvian destruction, when the world was destroyed with water, we believe that as Christians. Noah had three sons, Ham, Sham, and Japheth, and we all come from them three boys. Had to. Now, if you notice, Peter was given the keys to the kingdom, and that was Jew, Gentile, and Samaritan. Now, Peter had the keys to the kingdom. On the day of Pentecost, he opened the gospel to the Jews. At seven, he opened it to the Samaritans. Philip went out and preached to the Samaritans. Only they hadn't believed, only he's been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And he went down and laid hands upon them, and they received the Holy Ghost. Then in Acts 10, 49, he opened the gospel to the Gentiles at the house of Cornelius. Yes, right. See? There are both Ham, Shan, and Japheth's people. Yes. Get it? Amen. The three races... Now, there were two races of them looking for a Messiah. That was the Jew and the Samaritan. But we, Anglo-Saxons, Gentiles, we worshiped idols. 
club on her back. And we worshiped idols. We wasn't looking for no Messiah. And he never did that before any Messiah. Uh, no, that sign there before any Gentile. Never. It's not written in the Word. But look, that was his sign. That proved that he was the Messiah. Look at these staunch Jews. Peter and who else could we say? Many of them. One was a blood issue. He touched his garment. Uh, Zacchaeus up in the tree. Blind Barnabas, his face stopped him. And he turned around. All those staunch Jews, he showed that he was the Messiah by being the prophet that manifested himself. Now, yeah. now we find out, we take them two, we're just going to take, now we're going to leave, we'll come back tomorrow night and pick up some more Jews. But now tonight, we're going on to a Gentile, or to a Samaritan. There's another race looking for a Messiah. Now when he's on earth, he's got to manifest himself to who's looking for him. Yeah. Got to. Amen. Notice. Now, here he made himself known to the Jews by what? Speaking the secrets of their heart. Tell them what they've done and so forth. We know that. Now, did that prove he was the word? How many believe that? Amen. Now, you're putting down scriptures. Put this down. Hebrews, the fourth chapter, about the twelfth verse. It said, The word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even to the sunder of the bone and the mire, and is a discerner of the thoughts in the heart. Amen. Is that right, brother? Amen. The word of God discerns the thoughts that's in their heart. He looked upon him and perceived their thoughts. Is that right? Yeah. What was it? It was the Word. Yeah. Yeah. The Word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword and a discerner of the thoughts of the heart. That's the reason they know that he was a manifestation of God's Word. Amen. Amen. That was Jesus yesterday. Yeah. Now, he was on his road down to Jericho. Jerusalem sets on the hill. Jericho sets in the valley. He was going to Jericho, but he had need to go by Samaria. Now, that's a, a city of Sychar. He stopped. He sent his disciples in to get something to eat. It must have been about noontime. While they were gone, there was a pretty woman come out there. She was of ill fame. We know what she mean there, the red light type, but she might have been a lovely girl. No doubt what she was a lovely girl, but maybe she had something to cause that. Maybe her mother turned her on the street when she was a kid. You know, we talk so much in America about juvenile delinquency. It ain't juvenile delinquency. It's parent delinquency. Sometimes a girl goes wrong because her mother don't make her do right. It's exactly right. So a lot of times it's parents' fault, not children, a juvenile delinquency. So here we find this young girl. She come out, she's a young woman, probably in her early 20s. She came out. Now, I've been in the Orient. I know the customs. It never changes. Now, the reason she didn't go early with the virgins to the well to get water, she wasn't permitted to. They don't associate together. And um, so she had to go out later. So here she come out along about noon, and you ought to see the way they pack water. They got a great big, it isn't a bucket, it's a, it's a clay pot. It uh, holds about uh, three gallons, I guess. It's got handles on it. And then they got a well with a window. And they take these hooks and dip it in these big jars and let it down, get it full of water, and windle it up. And I've seen young girls, no, <laughs> well, just young girls, sit and put one of those big pots of water on top of her head. One on each shoulder, and a whole bunch of them go along talking, shaking their heads, talking one another, never spill a drop in their eye. How they do it, I don't know. They still do it. Talk just as ladies can, you know. So they go along there just really uh, carrying a conversation and never spill a bit of water. And they still do it. Now she come out to get her pot of water, and she started to let it down. Now, that well, it still stands there. It's just, it's one of jo jo Jacob give Joseph his son. And so, um, there's a little panoramic about like this platform up here. And this, and there's a wall around and then the public well there where the people drink. So she started to let down the bucket in uh, the pot and she heard somebody say, Woman, bring me a drink. And she turned and looked. Now he wasn't but about 33 years old, but he looked over 50. Do you know the Bible said that? In St. John 6, when they said, I am the bread of life that come from God out of heaven. Your fathers eat men in the wilderness and are dead. He said, but I'm the bread of life that come from God out of heaven. If a man eats this bread, he'll never die. Oh, they went ahead and just gushed in a little while. And um, so then they, he said, he told them, said, uh, uh, you say that you're seen Abraham when you're not over 50 years old. He was only 30. But his work must have made him look 50. You're not a man over 50 years old. And say that you saw Abraham, said, now we know you got a devil. And you're mad, crazy, see? He said, before Abraham was, I am. <laughs> that settled it. 
And here he was now about a, a, a young Jew sitting over there just watching. And so he said, bring me a drink. She said, it's not customary. They had segregation then like we used to have in the South, you know, between the colored and white. said, it's not customary for you being a Jew ask me a Samaritan woman to, for anything. So we had no dealing with one another. He said, woman, if you knew who you were talking to, you'd ask me for a drink. And I'll give you water, you don't come here to draw. She said, the well's deep. See, still the carnal thinking. The well's deep. And said, you have nothing to draw with. He said, the water that I give is everlasting life. Spring it up. They've got the character. What was he doing? He's contacting her spirit. See? Contacting her. When he caught what her trouble was, how many knows what her trouble was? She had five husbands. She's living with her six. He said, woman, go get your husband and come here. She said, I don't have any husband. He said, you told the truth. Said, you've got five, had five, and the one you're living with now is not yours, in that you said the truth. Now look, when he did that before them Jews, them Jews said them big high priests and educators of them days said, <clears throat> they had to answer the church, it was being done, so they had to tell their congregation something. They couldn't bypass it because they had to meet the issue. So he said, <clears throat> said, this man is Beelzebub, the prince of the devils, a fortune teller, in other words. Said he's a fortune teller, and anybody knows the fortune tellers of the devil. So it said, uh, said he's Beelzebub, the fortune teller. All right. And when he did that, he turned around and looked at them Jews. He said, I'll forgive you. I, the Son of Man, will forgive you for saying this, blaspheming the Word of God. But said, someday, in other words, the Holy Ghost is coming to do the same work. And one word against it will never be forgiven a man in this world, neither the world that is to come. So you see where it puts us. Yeah. One word against it will never be forgiven. That's blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. When he saw him standing there with the... He was the Word. And the Word was expressing itself just like the Bible said. And they said he's a fortune teller. And you know what happened to him? Every one of them was lost. Exactly. Now, here he stands with this woman. And he said, go get your husband. She said, I have none. He said, you said, well, you've had five. And the one you're living with now is not yours. She went, look at this little prostitute. She turned and she said, Sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. What a difference. That woman knows more about God than half of the preachers in the United States. That's right. In her condition. Look, she said, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. We, the Samaritans, we know that Messiah is the coming, which is called Christ. And when he comes, that will be his sign. Oh, That's what he was yesterday. See? Amen. See? We know that Messiah, which is called Christ, when he comes, he'll tell us these things. Who art thou? And he said, I'm he that speaks to you. Glory. And what did she do? She left that water pot. She ran into the city. And she said, come see a man that's told me the things I've done. Isn't this the very Messiah? And the people in the city believed on him because the woman said that he told her what she had done. Is that right? Amen. Well, that was Jesus yesterday. Yes. Now, it wasn't his dress. They all dressed alike. It wasn't the way he wore his beard or combed his hair. They all wore it the same. But it was the manifestation of God's Word in him, discerning the thoughts of the heart. Exactly. How many believe that? Yes. Well, that's Jesus yesterday. That'd be Jesus today, wouldn't it? The same Jesus. Same Jesus as with Moses. Moses forsook Egypt, esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than that of Egypt. That was Jesus yesterday. Paul said, He's the same today and will be forever. Why is it? Jesus is the Word. The manifestation of the Word. The Word made flesh. Now, in closing, I might say this. We just stand here all night. But we never get to the end of it because it's just a whole Bible just hugged right around there. See? Now, remember, that was the end of the Jewish dispensation and the, and the Samaritans. That, that ended them. Now, being three, that was Ham and Shem's people. Now, what about Japheth's people? This people, the Gentiles. Now, we wasn't looking for no Messiah. And they had 4,000 years to believe he was coming. And when he come, they didn't believe him. And he done the Messiah sign to prove that he was Messiah. And those... Jews that were ordained to life believed it. Look at that little prostitute. 
Well, she'd stayed out of churches, probably far more cold and stiff. Didn't do her no good. But it's, she was predestined to eternal life. And as soon as that thing was done, quickly she recognized it. What was it? That life, that seed broke forth the life. Glory. Yes, all the Father has given me will come. And no man can come except my Father draws him first. Amen. There you are. And as soon as that light flashed, what did she say? She said, Sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. We know Messiah is coming to do this thing. And when he comes, he said, I'm he that speaks with you. Now, it wasn't right for her to go in the city, but try to stop her, no matter what she was. Try to stop her once. It's like they're putting a house out there on far on a windy day. Oh, she had a testimony. She knowed the word. And she said, There's the Messiah there. He told me the things I've done. Search the scriptures, is, and that's the very Messiah. And the man said that this... And they believed on him. He didn't do it no more. He just done it to that one woman. Showed her that. And all the men of the city believed on Jesus. Because the woman said that. Oh, my. Now, he didn't do any miracles. He walked away because he knew Philip was coming right down to do the miracles right behind him. So he just left that alone walked away. They know that was Messiah. That was enough. The miracles would take place as long as you recognize the Messiah. Now, look. Now, we've had 2,000 years of theology like the Jews had 4,000 years. God from the Gentiles will take a, a people for his name. Do you believe that? Yes. All right. Now, do you believe we're at the evening time? Yes. Now, look what Jesus said over here. I'm going to quote uh, from you from Luke 17, uh, 28. Jesus said, as it was in the days of Sodom. Now, I'm closing. In the days of Sodom, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. How many ever read that? As it was in the days of Sodom, so shall it be when the Son of Man comes. Now, it, can't, it, it can't fail. He said it. See? Now notice. Now, he went ahead and told about Noah, how they were eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, the immorals of it. And then said, likewise, as it was in the days of Sodom, will it be at his coming? Notice. At the days of Sodom. Now wait, there was a man who had been called... By election, Abraham. He was just an ordinary man. God called him when he was 65 years old. And he was 75 and his wife was 65 and told him he was going to have a baby. And he believed that word for 25 years. And he was 100 and his wife was 90. And the baby comes. Wish I had time to go through that little study with you for about a week here. Oh, my. I believe that Indian faith would go from out of the top of the tavern. <laughs> See, to lay that out. I just come through Grass Valley down there. Oh, my. And in Grass Valley where the tapes and things had been played prior to coming, and I took that, I didn't pray for anybody, just leave it alone, and took that and laid that Abraham's seed and Abraham's uh, faith as Abraham's seed. Not only God promised Abraham, but his seed after him. And we are Abraham's seed, and we're in Christ. We're the royal seed of the promise. And what did Abraham do? Call those saints which were not as though they were because God said so. My, I can see when God told him, said, Abraham, you're going to have a baby by your wife. Now remember, 65, she's about 15, 20 years past menopause. Change of life. Now, he had lived with her since she was 18 years old. There's no baby. She was sterile. She was barren. He was sterile. No baby. And yet God said, you're going to have it. And Abraham staggered out the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong, giving praise to God. Right. right. What about his children? That was the natural seed. How about the royal seed through Christ with the same faith that he received to get him by? Amen. Amen. Oh, my. That pack you up the under blood beyond the moon and stars and run you up the Milky White way. Yes, sir. Past Jupiter, Venus, and Mars, and Mars. On that faith, you see, Abraham's faith. Notice. I can see Abraham saying, come home out of the field and say, honey, get ready, we're going to have a baby. Could you imagine an old man, 75 years old, his wife, 65, go down to the doctor and say, doc, I tell you what, make ready, we're going to have a baby. We don't get a hospital room ready. The doctor say, oh, oh yeah, yes, sir, uh-huh, and call the police right quick to pick him up. He's off of his head, see? see? Anybody who takes the word of God, believes the word of God, is considered a little crazy. No, they are, because they've lost the mind of the world. they got the mind of God, see? Uh, get things ready. Well, then, the first... 28 days passed, and I, our little Sarah got the booties ready, you know, and got all the little booties ready, and got the bird eye and the pins and everything got ready. So, go to have the baby, sure as the world. And then 28 days passed, said, How you feeling, sweetheart? No different. Glory to God, go have the baby anyhow. Amen. Now, God's going to say, I told you wouldn't have it. God said, Separate yourself, my unbelievers. 
Come over here another one and walk with me. Oh, oh, oh my. Get away from the unbelievers. They'll, they'll hurt you. Come out from among them. That's right. Get away from them. They don't want to believe. First, first year passed. Abraham walked up and said, Sarah, honey, how you feel? No difference, sweetheart. Glory to God, the baby's a year more miracle. Hallelujah. We'll have it anyhow. Keep the booties ready. Well, about 10, 15 years, maybe 20 years past, she said, Abraham, honey, these booties are getting kind of old. Knit you some new ones. Hallelujah. We'll have it anyhow. But, but Abraham, I don't feel any difference. Nothing what you feel. God said so. That's it. Go to heaven anyhow. God said so. Oh, brother. Oh, <laughs> now he's a hundred years old. Oh, my. Sarah's 90. Little grandma, you know. How you feel, honey? No difference there. Hallelujah. We'll have it anyhow. <laughs> Look what God did for him. He changed him. Made him a young man again. Her too. Really? Absolutely. If that's not right, when they went down to Greer, why did Cain fall in love with that little grandma looking for him, a sweetheart, and said, it's the prettiest thing he ever saw. said, you're a fair to look up on. <laughs> little grandma and us, she turned back to a young woman showing exactly what God's going to do to every one of Abraham's seed. Hallelujah! Every man and woman, no matter what your age is and how old you are, God will turn you sometime back to a young man and a young woman again. For the glory of God, because you're the seed of Abraham. Oh, my. How I love that. Now, notice. He said, as it was in the days of Sodom. Now we see Abraham come up to Sodom. God had dealt with him through the years of all kinds of signs and wonders. But now wait, just as he did Abraham's seed. We've, we've been Pentecost now for 50 years. We've seen speaking in tongues, interpretation of tongues. We've seen divine healing signs and everything. But now wait a minute. Sodom is fixing to be burned. Not Noah's flood now. This is Sodom, he said. And look at the immoral increase in the world in the last few years. Forty years or something. Look how it's increasing by the day, by the hour. Passing over Hollywood the other day, I had a, uh, sometime ago I had a plane right for homosexual. And Los Angeles has increased, uh, uh, California had increased 30% over last year. Yeah, okay. See? Perversion, just exactly like Sodom. The whole world's turned that way. This west coast where the east and west is met here. See? That's right. So now we see we're at the last days. Like Abraham, his royal seed has come up to the last days. Like Abraham himself come up to the last days. Now, remember there's always three classes of people. And here I'm going to name them. That believers make believers and unbelievers. <laughs> there never crowd. So you, you have them. So there they was. Here was Abraham, the called out and elected church. Locked the cold formal church down in Sodom with the Sodomites. And one day when the hour was just about ready for the burning of the earth at that time, Abraham was sitting under his oak. Now listen real close. Don't miss this. Now Jesus said it will repeat at the end time. It's before he comes. Now there come up three angels. And one of them was God. So he sat down with Abraham. And two of them went down in Sodom and preached the gospel to them. Is that right? A modern Billy Graham to the church normal that's in Sodom. Great man like that. Old Robert. Going down there performing. They didn't do much of a miracle, not too many. They did something, smiting the blind, preaching the gospel. Smite. There they was in that denominational rim. Went down there preaching the gospel. Billy Graham, that great mighty evangelist to the Baptist and Presbyterian. Oh, he lays a line down to them. But you see... He preached to them, calling them out. But there was one who stayed behind with Abraham. And he gave Abraham a sign. Now listen real close. Just the day before that, his name had been Abram. And her name was S-A-R-A-I, Sarah. And he changed his name from Abram to Abraham, father of nations. H-A-M. A-B-E-R-H-A-M. Seven letters. A B E R H A M. Abraham. Now, he changed Sarah's name from S A R A I to S A R A H, princess. Now, the angels it went down in there, went out and preached the gospel and tell them to get out of get out of that mess down there. Come out from among it. And isn't that what Billy Graham and them great yeah. Jack Schuler and them guys today? calling out a Babylon worldwide. But the angel had stayed with the church that never was in Sodom. Watch what he did for a sign. Now, Sarah wasn't like the modern women of the day. She sat in the tent. 
So this angel said to Abraham, he said, Abraham, not Abram, Abraham. How do you know his name is Abraham now? Where is your wife, S-A-R-A-H, Sarah? How do you know he's married? How do you know his name is Abraham when it was Abram? How do you know Sarah, his wife was, uh, Sarah was Sarah? Yeah. Abraham, where is your wife, Sarah? Yeah. Abraham looked at him and said, "Why well, she's in the tent behind you. He said, Abraham, I am going to visit you according to the time of life. I. That personal pronoun again, the very one giving the name, see? I am going to visit you according to the time of life. And Sarah, inside the tent behind the man, said, me an old woman. Well, I said, I haven't had pleasure with my Lord or her husband there for maybe it's been 20 years. Said, me an old woman and my Lord also old. We have pleasure again like young people. And she, what we call, laughed up her sleep, trying to her And the angel said, why did Sarah laugh? Scared her to death. What was it? Now, what was that? And that man that talked to Abraham, Abraham called him God. Yeah. Capital L O R D, and any Bible scholar knows that that's the, the self existing one. Elohim. See? The self existing God. Some man said to me, he said, You wouldn't believe that was God. I said, The Bible said it was God. Amen. I said, Why, well, what? That's a God. I said, We're made out of 16 elements. That's calcium, potash, and petroleum, and cosmic light. God just reached out a handful of those elements of the world and said, Step in there, Gabriel. We're going down to Sodom. Yeah. Reach over to God's handful. Step in there, Michael. And stepped in himself. Yeah. Why, he did. He eat. He eat, the, he eat a calf that Abraham killed. Is that right? Yeah. Drunk the milk and eat some cornbread. Yeah. And eat the bud. Yeah. That's right. God. Yeah. Well, I, I'm glad. It says for God, you just forget who he is. I'm so glad. I got just about four or five hairs left, you know. And the other day I was combing them four or five hairs. My wife said to me, she said, Billy, you're getting bald-headed. I said, but I haven't lost one of them. She said, what? I said, I haven't lost one of them. She said, I pray you tell me where they're at. I said, all right, sweetheart, I will. You tell me where they was before I got them. They're there waiting for me to come to them. <laughs> yes. That's right. He said, over here, your hand's numbered. Nothing will be lost. I'll raise it up again in the last day. He that give it to me now, can he give it back again by promise? If he can make me what I am without a choice, how much more can he make me back by a choice for taking him? Amen. 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 Oh, I feel religious now. <laughs> yes, sir. And oh, that there's coming a resurrection. And we'll be restored again like he showed Abraham in there. Notice. Now, Jesus said that was, that was God manifested in a human flesh. I want to ask you something. Isn't it strange to that nominal church out there? We have never in all the ages, never have we ever had a man, a minister in them churches, that his name ended with H-A-M until today. H-A-M. Do you know that right? We've had a Moody, a Sankey, Billy Sunday, and uh, Knox, Calvin, Spurgeon, all down. We've had all kinds of men, but never one ended with H-A-M, G-R-A-H-A-M. To the church down in Sodom, G-R-A-H-A-M, the messenger to the church of Sodom, showing exactly the message that was, they did then. And did not Jesus say as it was in the days of Sodom? Amen. There's Billy Graham, G-R-A-H-A-M, out there in the field. Now, he sends the messenger to the church elected, the Pentecostal elected, pulled out. Yes. Not out there in the normal church, but the church elected. Yes. And the church in itself is the Holy Spirit moving in the church is what does the work. That wasn't that body of flesh that probably vanished. But it was God in that flesh yes. showing that God would again dwell in the redeemed flesh of His church in the last days. Yes. And would do the same sign. Yes. As it was in the days of Sodom, so shall it be in the body of the Son of Man. Hallelujah. There we are. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. Sir, we would see Jesus. Oh, sure. What would you see? The manifestation of the Word. And the Word is sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even the son of the bone, and a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Friends, that was Jesus yesterday. 
And if the Word is manifested again today, it won't be Jesus today, it will be the same yesterday. How many believe that? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, your great August presence is in here, making your children happy, pouring out the oil of faith into their heart to receive the blessings of God that's laid up for them. Now we are called by your name, and you said if we'd assemble and pray that you'd hear from heaven, heal the land. And here we are tonight, way up here at the end of the roads, out here on the islands, way out past the west coast, way back. And you said, the prophet said, it shall be light in the evening time. Sitting in this building tonight are the Indians that you put here, and the secret is with you, how you got them here, but you brought them here. We're right at the border of the waters, and we see the messenger that's gone to the called seat of Abraham, the church positionally, that's got out there in Babylon, showing his sign out there. Oh, Lord, we pray tonight that in Jesus' name that you will let this little group of people know. That you're not dead. You've raised from the dead. And 2,000 years of criticism couldn't get rid of you. You're still here. Proving that you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, Heavenly Father, a lovely group of people here. They set this hot building. And now reward them, Lord. And I'm looking with child anticipation. With a heart like a child around Christmas time. Waiting. Ever all these years, Lord, you've never failed us, but yet my heart jumps every time I think of you coming into our presence, or us into your presence. Now I pray, Father, that you will come into our hearts, give these people faith tonight to believe, and grant now that you'll give me faith, Lord, but my faith without theirs would do no good. We must have faith together because we are a unit. We are the body of the Lord Jesus. And we've assembled ourselves together in a little rented hall tonight, as they did in days gone by, 2,000 years ago. And now we pray in this upper room tonight that you'll move in here and we'll show to this people that you're still alive. And Father, if you'll just do it, everybody in here will go away happy. They'll go away believing for their sickness and their sins to be forgiven. They'll have courage. These Many of these poor people who don't have even hardly enough to eat, perhaps, and some of them are, are down to meager living. Others are maybe, Lord, just struggling day by day, and we're all poor, Lord, and we're, we're, trying, to, we're trying to make heaven our home. Come among us tonight, Father. These words that I've preached, they'll just fall by the wayside if you don't come and confirm them. Grant it, Lord. We'll thank you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I'm going to tell you, it's quarter until ten. Would you give me just a little short prayer line, about 15 minutes? Let's, will you do it? All right. Now, I believe Billy said he'd give out I mean, about 50 prayer cards. All right. Now, the prayer cards, everybody's got a prayer card. Hold it like this. It's just a little prayer card with a number on it. It's got a number on a prayer card. And now, we would like to see, let's see, where shall we start? Let's start at one tonight. One, two, three, four, five. Let's see them stand up. One, two, three, four, five. Prayer card number one. Who has number one, two, three, four, five? Let's see your hand. One, two, three. Let's see another one. One, two, three, four, five. As sure all the people know each. All of each. Who has prayer card number one? Raise up your hand. Number one. Number two. Two. How would the Indian say two if he stayed his own language? All right. You heard it. Number two. Prayer card number two. Number three. Who has number three? 
The lady has number three. Number four. Who has number four? Prayer card, that lady there. All right. Surely there's one, two, or three here somewhere. Look, everybody look one another's cards. Look over. Everybody's got a card. Raise up your hand. Everybody's got a prayer card. Raise up your hand. Now look at one another's card. Look over, see, maybe they can't hear it. See, maybe somebody's deaf and, and I miss them right by. And see, they, or maybe they can't walk. They're crippled and can't walk. One, two. Who has one or two? Three, the lady has it. Four, we have it. All right. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. All right, let them stand up and come over here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Let them just come out over here in the corner. That's good. There's three cards missing now. There's three of them missing now. You see what reason I want to get every one of them? Because somebody writes and tells me later, said, well, nobody told me. I was deaf. I couldn't get up. And nobody told me. See? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Here's another. This uh, uh, fellow here. Now, what's his number? Two. All right, one. One, prayer card one. We got two, three, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. We like one. Number one. Well, if they stepped out, maybe they stepped out, and they'll be back in just in a minute. All right? If they do, they got their place in the line. Now, remember, everybody holding a prayer card, if we don't get to it tonight, we're going to get to it, and we're going to pray for everybody that comes to the meeting and wants to be prayed for. Now, let's see, that's... 10, 9, let's see, 10, 11, who has prayer card 11? No, 12, all right, sir, 13, 14, all right, lady, over here, 15, Now, when you come, let me say this, see. Now, when you come and get a card, hold to it, see. Don't change it. You give it to somebody. You've got to be here to get it yourself. Take your card and hold it. See, you see, someone else will take that place, you see. If you get a card, hold it. We don't know where we're. The Holy Spirit will have us pulling, and we, we want you down that time. So you come, get your card. Let's start, all right, that others come in, and we've got about two or three missing, but that'll be all right. Now, we want you to... To believe now with all your heart. Now, I want your attention here. How many in the building that's sick and does not have a prayer card and won't be called in the line, raise up your hands. Let's see. Everybody? Well, it's just practically all the way around. Now, here. Now, while they're getting that prayer line up through that room there, I want to ask you something. Listen, I'll close now. Now, all I've said will go in vain if this isn't so. If any man can say anything, but if, God, if it isn't God's word, don't believe it's the first place. But if it's God's word, then look for God to keep that promise. Amen. Because God's got to keep his promise Amen. in order to be God. If I'm going to be honest, I've got to keep my promise. See? Yes. A man of honor, a man of honor always keeps his word. See? You always keep your word. Now, each one of you out there that's not in this prayer line and won't be in it without prayer cards, you just look this away. Let me tell you what you do. There was a little woman one time in the Bible, and I'm going to give you a little story. She didn't have a prayer card either, but she seen Jesus come across the sea and was down there. Someone told her, is that, and she believed if she could only touch his garment, that she'd be made well. Did you ever hear the story? How many ever heard it? Sure. The woman touched it. She had a blood issue. And now remember, now I've been in that country. The Palestinian garment hangs loose. It's a robe. And it's got an underneath garment under that to keep the dust off the limbs. Now, if she touched the border of his garment, physically, he didn't feel it. You know what I mean? He didn't feel it in his body. But she said within herself, I believe he's a holy man. And if I can just touch him, I'll be made well. Is that right? And she had a blood issue. And she pushed through the crowd. And she got out and she touched the border. That was that far from his legs where that garment swings out. 
And she touched the border of his garment and got up and went back and maybe sat down in the audience. And Jesus stopped. He said, who touched me? And you know what Peter said? Peter rebuked him. He said, Lord, why would you say a thing like that? He said, well, everybody's touching him. Hello, old rabbi, a great prophet of God, you deceiver. Everybody, see, everybody's touching him. He said, everybody's touching him. Why would you say, who touched me? He said, but I perceive that I've gotten weak. Virtue, strength went from me. I've gotten weak. That one little woman touched him and made him weak. And he turned. He looked over the audience until he found her. Told her what her trouble was and said her faith had made her well. Is that right? Yes. Now that was Jesus Christ yesterday. Is that right? Yes. Well, if he's the same today, won't he do the same? Yes. Now for my minister brothers, they might want a scripture for that. I'm going to give you one now. The Bible said in Hebrews, the third chapter, that Jesus Christ right now, today, is a high priest that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities. Is that right, brother? How many knows that's the truth? The Bible says that. That he's a high... Well, then, if he's the same high priest, how would he act today? The same as he did then. Yes. Does that make him the same yesterday and forever? Yes. Then, now, if you come here and touch me, I'm like your daddy or your brother, husband, or what more, it wouldn't do a bit of good. I'm just a man. Touch your pastor, same thing. But you touch him. Yes. And watch the spirit move down. Yes. See? Yes. <laughs> Amen. That's it, you see. That makes him the same yesterday and forever. It wouldn't be me. It would be a gift that he works through. Brother Woods, did you bring them pictures with you or anything? You got them? Or you have them up there on the platform? Did you see them tonight? We'll have them tomorrow night. How'd I see the picture of it? We got it right here, brother. Right by, hanging in Washington, D.C., copyrighted. The only supernatural being was ever photographed. That same pillar of fire that followed the children of Israel. Here it is. And it'll do the same work that it did. Jesus said, I come from God. That's went to God. He died, rose, ascended into heaven, and Paul, on his road down to Damascus, a big pillar of fire struck him blind. He said, Lord, who are you? He said, I'm Jesus. Is that right? Yes. Same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, you, without a prayer card, you look this away, and you just start praying. You start praying, saying, Lord Jesus, I believe you. And that little old man standing on a platform, he doesn't know me. Well, there isn't a person in this building I know outside of Brother Woods. I see him stand back there. I believe that's a couple of brethren there, Brother uh, Fred Stoffman from Canada here. I know him. But no one in this vicinity here. There, how many of you there's a stranger coming? You raise up your hand. Everyone's a stranger. You know what? I don't know you. Raise up your hand. You people in the prayer line know that I'm a stranger to you. Raise up your hand. All right? Now, you just believe and say, Lord Jesus, by faith, I believe that what that brother said is the truth. I'm sick, Lord. Let me touch you. And then say, act upon him. Watch the Holy Spirit move right down through here and do the same thing he did. If it doesn't do it, then I'm a false prophet. If it does do it, then you believe it. That's right. Now, man, did you give the boy your card in there? Yeah, okay. Right. You speak English all right. We are, we're strangers to one another. I believe he's an Indian brother. Indian. Well, here we are, two strangers. Two men have never met before in life. Now, he stands here, just a man. I stand here as the man. He's here for some reason. I don't know. I've never seen him. And I, which is our first time. But now, if Christ is the same yesterday and forever, he might be. This man might be here for maybe it's financial needs. Maybe it's domestic trouble, something wrong in his home. It may be that he's sick. Or maybe he's standing here for somebody else. I don't know. I've never seen him. But now, if he was standing here and I said, Glory to God, hallelujah, God sent me to pray for sick, lay hands on him. I said, You sick, mister? He said, Yes, I'm sick. I lay hands on him and said, Glory to God, go, get well. That'd be all right. But what if the Holy Spirit comes down here and tells him what he has been? Yeah. He'll know whether that's the truth or not. And if he knows what he has been, he can surely believe what he will be if he can tell him what has been. Is that right? Now, how many of you would believe that with all your heart? Say, I will accept it. I may the Lord God grant it. I just want you to look this way, uh, sir, just to talk with you a minute, being a stranger. And if there's any way that I could do to help you, I would do it. But if the Lord God can tell me, like, uh, uh, what you're here for, what you've done, what you should have done, or what's wrong with you or something, you'd know whether that was the truth or not. And so then we'd make the audience believe. Make you believe, wouldn't it? Of course, you know, I, would have, I couldn't do it myself because I'm just a man like you are. 
It has to be some supernatural power. And if it's a supernatural power, now the Pharisees of that day said it, it was Beelzebub, the devil. See what happened to them. Them that believed it was Christ received Christ's reward. Now I tell you now, the man standing here is under difficult. That's right. He's standing here because he hardly knows which way to go because it's a, something strange. It's the first time in this country. Don't be alarmed, sir. That won't hurt you. That's Christ. Let me show you that it is. You're here for healing. You're weak. You've had some trouble. You've been in an operating room. You had an operation, and that was for a, an ulcer in the stomach. And you've gotten real weak over that. And you're here for... A, 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 is that right? Raise up your hand. It's all over. You're going to get well. God bless you. Your faith makes you whole. You believe? Sir, we would see Jesus. We would see Jesus. Now, probably his Indian friends out there knew him. If, uh, if you can just believe. All right? Now, here is a woman from the anglo saxon Now, here is a man and a woman. I suppose we're strangers to one another. We First time we've met. Now, I do not know the woman. I have never seen her in my life. She's a stranger. And now we've probably, uh, she's a little older than I, and we are, we are born miles apart and years apart, and this is the first time we meet. But now, if the Holy Spirit of God will let me know what you're here for, or something about you, you know that I don't know, then make you believe one. All right, you just believe now. The lady, I see her sitting at a table. No, she's backing away. It's her stomach. She has stomach trouble. That's exactly right. A peptic condition, and it causes burning acids and so forth. You've got a nervous condition. It causes you to get gloomy. Way late in the evening, you get all wore out and tore up. That's right. You believe God can tell me who you are? Would that help you? Miss Burling? And that's right. <laughs> all right. Go believe now. That stomach trouble will leave you as well. Do you believe with all your heart now? Just have faith. Don't doubt. Right. Now, now that makes me weak. 